I'm Manu Kakobian. Thank you for tuning in and thank you to our partners, personal injury attorney Nelson Yavorkin. Hi, everyone. We are joined by Regis Progre, who's getting ready to return to the ring October 26 against Jack Catterall. Fights taking place in Manchester in the UK. Regis, your former two time title holder, mm -hmm. on the quest to go for a third time. Jack right. Catterall obviously is a fantastic opponent for you to uh, level up into a, a championship opportunity. There's been some postponements, but you're still in training camp. How have you been preparing for this fight? This is your first fight since the loss to Devin Haney. Uh, how have you been uh, preparing for this for this fight? Um, I mean, for the, for the most part, same like everything, you know, just really get back to my roots and just get back to being me. I feel like I lost myself for the last like year. I lost myself or whatever, but I feel like right now I'm just get back to being me and stuff, you know. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, we had a postponement. It was supposed to be August 24th. I went to the West Coast. I was in Vegas training. And they just, you know, they said it's postponed. So I kind of, I left. I actually left before they told me that. And um, I came back here. And I mean, I'm I'm just, just getting back to it here. And I mean, I feel good. Do you know the nature of the injury he suffered? Uh, I heard it was a, a, a bruised rib. That's what I heard. But I don't know if that's true because um, I think a bruised rib, it take way longer than that to heal. So I don't know. That's what I'm, I'm hearing. But at the same time, it's kind of like hush, hush. But that's kind of where I'm here. So yeah, because really when they made the me. announcement, there was no um, uh, reasoning for the injury. Usually, uh, they do indicate what the what the issue was. Does that right. kind of the, the does the lingering uh, unknown also is that a good thing or a bad thing for you? Uh, for me, it's a good thing. You know, I feel like uh, for me, it's a good thing. I mean, maybe he wasn't ready. Maybe he wasn't. Um, yeah, maybe I feel like maybe he wasn't ready to fight or something like that. I don't know. But for me, it's it's a good thing. Mentally, it's definitely a good thing for me. And I, it gave me actually more confidence because I, I, I really I don't want to say he don't want to fight, but it's just it, maybe they take it a little more time. Maybe they're trying to stall me out and stuff. But um, I just feel like that's not going to work because, you know, they did that to, you know, ah, shit, I'm getting a call. I got to let me tell I can't do that. Um, so, you know, I. Like I said, man, um, but they did that for me. That's what they did, you know, with the Devin Haney thing. They they postponed it way back. And they, I, I kind of stayed in camp for so long. And really, you're not supposed to do that. That's kind of, I feel like that's what kind of messed me up a little bit too. Um, But this one, I didn't, nah, it, it's not going to work this time. I remember, you know, I, I was there with you in camp in, in North Hollywood at the Brick House Boxing Club. You told me that was the longest training camp of your life. I think you were training from like September. For that yeah, class. it was a, it was like four months. It was like usually I do a, a six to eight week camp, and I did like a four month training camp, and which was, in hindsight, you look at it, it was too long. It was definitely too long. But when I was doing it, I wanted to do it. You know, I was like, man. But my coach tell me about that all the time. My coach Bobby, he tell me about that all the time. He was like, you know, a lot of fighters they do something that get them to the top, and then they get something really big, and then they switch things up. And that's kind of what I did. I I did. I, you know, I got there, I got to the top, I became a champion. I became a two-time champion three years later, and I did that having having a certain formula, and then I got a big fight with Devin, and I tried to change everything up. You know, I, I did, I did, I literally changed everything up, and it's like, it's not what got me to, so, um, that I mean, that's that's kind of what happened, though, because, you know, people ask me, reporters ask me why I was in training, man, you don't think you, you go overtrain, you don't think it's distraction in LA, and I was like, nah, nah, it's not, but then you look back, and it probably was. Yeah, because, I mean, just boxing aside, I mean, anyone who has that big moment in life, a career-changing opportunity, naturally they're going to try to over-prepare and make sure they're ready for that opportunity. And yeah. sometimes over-preparation could work against you as well, too, especially right. – but boxing, of course, it's physical. So uh, yeah, yeah. The, well, it wasn't – for me, it wasn't a – it was more of a mental thing. Physically, I was – I felt like I was good physically. You know, it was just more of a mental thing because the thing is, in camp, camp is so hard. You know, I train three, four times a day. So, the thing – like, camp is so hard. Like, you need these, like, mental breaks, and I didn't give myself that. And so then when it – once it got closer to the fight, then I kind of started to, I think, break down and try to give myself mental breaks, and that was the wrong time to give myself that. I should have been – doing it way earlier, but, you know, I mean, listen, you live and you learn, and it's, it's all instruction. That's how it is. You learn from it. Right. You know, Jack Catterall, he uh, obviously had a nice win against Josh Taylor. Uh, mm -hmm. Certainly a different version of Josh Taylor than the one you faced five years ago, uh, but he did 
he did beat him. What was your assessment of Catterall's performance against Taylor? I mean, I think he did what he's supposed to do. I, I felt like I really felt like Josh. I mean, still, I feel like Josh Taylor shot right now. I think he's the same fighter, but um, it was a closer fight than the first fight. I think the first fight he he really won that fight. The second fight, I think he you can give it to him, but it was it was closer. It was definitely a closer fight. Josh Taylor pushed the action. He definitely pushed it more. Um, but I mean, I feel like they owed him. They they kind of just owed Jack um Catterall that win, and so that's why he got it. You know, Jack is not a title holder, but he's certainly perhaps even more dangerous than some of the title holders right mm -hmm. now in the division. Do where do you rank ja, uh, Jack as far as uh, the hundred forty pound picture? He, he, I mean, he's up. I think he's, I think he's up there. He's definitely up there high right now because, um. At first, you know, you had all these guys that was, you know, they had belts and stuff, but uh, most of them, all those guys, they, they getting beat. You know, a lot of these guys are getting beat. They're not looking good, all that type of stuff. So I feel like, you know, Jack is, you know, he's 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 one of the ones that's at the top right now. Yeah, this is a big fight for you because the 140-pound picture is stacked mm -hmm. and a win really sets up your next two, three fights against the top five of the division, perhaps a title shot. Um, when knowing that you know at the age of 35 that you need to capitalize on this window, what is your uh, approach mentally uh, for, for this fight? Just being me. That's why I, I keep saying this in every interview I do. Just being me. Just just getting back to being me, being the person that got there. That's the main thing. Just just going out there and being me, and it really just enjoy myself. I I felt like man, I put I put too much pressure on myself. Um and. And really, I have to have goals. I feel like I have to have goals. So, something that I really wanted for a long time, and I it was like I wanted to be a champion again. The set, the to two time champ. I really wanted that, and I I passed a lot of opportunities up at one forty seven for big money. And I was like, you know, people was like, man, you crazy. Like, why are you doing this? You you might as well go to one forty seven and do this and make this money. I'm like, nah, I want to be a champion again at one forty. And then I did it, and then it was like, all right, I I wanted that so bad, and I did it. And then I didn't. I I felt like I really didn't have nothing else to to do. And, you know, now it's like, all right, I have a goal. Like I want to be a three-time champion. That's my goal right now. So um, now I'm just mentally just being back, just being me and just really, you know, going out there and enjoying myself and like having fun. I really love boxing. Like I, it's, it's, it's no other way around. I really just love the sport of boxing and um, I, I enjoy doing it. I enjoy compete. I enjoy watching. I enjoy competing in it. So just going out there and being me again. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a southpaw. Catterall's a southpaw. Do you enjoy facing southpaws? I do now. I, I I honestly like my my last. I mean, I fought maybe five. The last couple of fights, it was like it was it was southpaws. So I kind of like fight. I rather fight a southpaw over orthodox right now. You know, it's it's because it's just been um. I don't know. I feel like it's easier to fight a southpaw than an orthodox right now, you know? So hopefully, I mean, people go watch it. They go, orthodox fighters go see it. They go, oh, let's fight them. But, you know, I rather, yeah, like right now, I mean, it's, for me, I think it's easier to fight a southpaw than an orthodox. I mean, over the last five years, you've certainly been almost exclusively been fighting southpaws. Guys like Josh Taylor, Red Catch, Tyrone McKenna, Jose Zapata. So it feels like, you know, Southpaws. Been just uh, outpaw. Yeah, it's just been a lot of South Terry Flanagan. You talk Terry Flanagan was a southpaw. Um, Julius Ndaga was a southpaw. I mean, I fought a bunch of southpaws, and even early in my career before that, I fought a whole bunch of southpaws. So yeah, I'm just, I guess I'm like used to them. So going back to the Haney fight, I mean, he, he was obviously uh, an orthodox fighter. He was the mm -hmm. bigger fighter that night. You, you've, I know you, we've talked about it as well too. But as time goes on. From that fight we're about nine months past that fight well what is the biggest learning experience and uh for you from that fight man a bunch of things man just from i just felt like at that time his his team was just a bet like he, they just the overall picture they just they they got in my head for the most part i think that's the that's the first thing i would say but you know just overall like just i switched the main thing is I switched a lot of things up. I should, I probably should never did, you know, like I switched from my head trainer from Bobby to Julian and maybe Julian wasn't ready for that big moment. And, and then just like having a long camp and just, you know, that's, I, I felt like I said, I, I did a lot of things that I wasn't supposed to do, but I wanted, I want to win so bad that I, 
I just overtrained. I did so much other stuff and I kind of let it get to me. And I think that was the, that's, I feel, I feel like that's the biggest thing that I took away from it. Just like, um, maybe just getting lost, getting lost in the, the moment. The moment was so big for me and just getting lost in that moment and just not just, just go out there and draw myself and do what I, you know, just do me, do what I do. And I didn't do me. I just was, I don't know what was going on. Right. And, you know, Devin uh, faced the same fate a few months later with his fight, obviously losing to Ryan Garcia, but under mm -hmm. different circumstances. Have you had a chance to connect with Devin uh, since your fight? Have you guys no, talked not, or anything not, like that? No, nah, I don't talk to Devin. I'm not gonna talk to him. Nah, I mean we not we not friends or nothing like that. He actually, he wrote me or something like that after right after the fight, and um asked my asked my number, but he never hit me up. I mean I, I don't if right now it don't make sense to talk to him because we still in the same division. I one day he might move to one forty seven or something like that. We might talk, but right now we still kind of like we'll we'll still kind of be enemies because it's a it's a possibility. I, after I beat Jack Hatter, it's a possibility I might fight him again. If he still has a belt, I can fight him again. Uh or something like that. So nah, we don't nah, we not we don't we don't talk. Uh -uh. Do you see Devin recovering from a fight like that? Do you think Devin Haney will be the same moving forward? You never know. You never it was a it was a it was a bad beating. Um, but you never know. It's about like it's about his mental and how can he come back from that. You I mean, it was a bad beating, and you know, beatings like that, they definitely take off your career. So, I I mean, it's just, we'll just, for me, I just feel like you, the whole world, they will just have to see. They will have to see how he comes back and how he performs after that. Some people, you know, some people can come back after that, and some people, they can't come back after that. So, I'm, I don't know. I just, it's really a question mark right now. You know, it seems like it's it's musical chairs in the 140-pound division right now. Anyone right. could anyone can lose on any given night. Uh, mm -hmm. we, saw, we saw that happen again with... Isak Pitbull Cruz losing to Jose Valenzuela. What was your assessment of that fight? And where do you, how do you assess Jose Valenzuela in the 140 pound picture now? I, honestly, I think I, I think I'll smoke him. I definitely think I'll smoke him. I don't, I don't, but I think I'll smoke everybody. You know, that's just my confidence in myself. But um, I, I mean, I just think that style with Pitbull. I, I never really. And, and and call me what you want, but I never really thought Pitbull was that good of a fighter. You know, he, you know, he got. I think he got famous against Tank because you know, um, you know, he went the distance with Tank. He gave Tank a hard fight, but you know, styles make fights. But I mean, I, as far as like a, you know, somebody like a southpaw that can move around on him, I think that'll, you know, it'll. It's not a hard fight. You know, he just he he comes and he does the same thing over and over again. That's that's kind of what he did with um Venezuela or whatever. Yeah, what's the name? Ryan, basically. And so, um, you know, and that's for me. That's just how you beat him. I mean, you got Valenzuela, another southpaw for you. So it's a, uh, it's definitely. Do you think that's a fight that that could be made? He got, he has a title. Uh, and, you know, the 140-pound picture has guys like Liam Paro, who's uh, tied to matchroom. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like the, the WBC situation will be uh, lingering until the Devin makes a, a decision. Teofimo at WBO, but he's always has his eyes on other things. It seems like 147 and up. Well, how soon do you think you can get that title shot? Oh. Um it depends, man. Right now, I'm just you know I'm kind of focused on Catterall, but I feel like, man, like this is the fight between me and me and Catterall. I think that's the biggest fight you can make in a division without a belt being on the line. So I think that you know after that, I definitely feel like I get a title shot right, probably right after that. If it's not, it'll be after that. So I, I don't have no, um, I don't have no doubt in myself that I'll be a champion again pretty soon. You know, maybe in like the, I would say maybe you know depending on the politics, but probably like 2025, 20, I probably have, a, I, I would think I would have a belt again. Gotcha. Will Will you be tied to Matchroom after this fight as well, too? Um, not after. No, this is this is actually my last fight with Matchroom. But I mean, I have a good working relationship with Matchroom. I mess with them. I like Matchroom. I like everything that Matchroom is doing. So you know, most likely I'll go right back to Matchroom. You know, because Matchroom is. I mean, if you look at everything that's going on, Matchroom is doing some of the biggest shows. So I think that man, I I. I'd rather, for me, stay with Matchroom. But obviously, you know, it's all about the money and it all depends, you know, who brings the best things. But it's, it's um right now, Matchroom is, is is doing some pretty big things. And then, like I said, they have the, you know, with the Liam Power situation, they have that over there. So that'll be an easy fight to make for, you know, for me and him. So 
Um, you know, we'll see. Just after I get past this fight, then, you know, we'll see what happens. And we'll see what happens with Matrim or whoever else offers me the best deal. It seems like this is the perfect time to also head into free agency. You get this big win against Catterall, and essentially every company has three or four guys credible you could be facing. I mean, we got right. we got Golden Boy with Jose Ramirez and Barboza, two guys you've always had your eye on. You got mm -hmm. top rank with guys like Sander Martin and um Theo. Um, Teofimo Lopez, of course, yes. And then, of course, Matchroom has Subrio, Matias, Richardson, Hitchens, Dalton Smith. They just reloaded the reserves with uh, Ernesto Tito Mercado, who I'm sure is going to be calling you out uh, at, at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. Who would be the perfect next opponent for you? You think uh, a guy like Paro or a guy like Matias or Ramirez uh, uh, beating another former champion to really put your put, uh, put your mark on the uh, the division? For me, look, it's a, I just want the belt. That's it. So I mean, if if I don't care who it is, who has the belt, I really don't. It, names don't even matter, man. I just want the belt. So for me, it'll be a right now. It'll be a power. It'll be a a teal. I think teal that'll be a a fight because obviously he's a bigger name and he has a belt. But you know, right now, you know, somebody like that, whoever has the belt, that's who I want. So I'm not really interested in like a Ramirez. Ramirez doesn't have a belt. A Matias, he doesn't have a belt. I'm not interested. In that. I'm interested. In, being a champion again. We've talked about this before. Obviously, Tank Davis, he's always lingering around the division. He considers the right fights at 140. I think that would be a tremendous promotion and a tremendous fight for you if Tank wanted to get his feet wet again at 140 pounds. Uh, I think that would be a tremendous opportunity for you, too. Again, Southpaw fighter, it seems like they're all Southpaws right. for you. Is the, Do you do you think a fight with Javante Davis would happen at this point of your career? Mm, you know, I mean, in boxing, man, you never know. You really, it's just you really just never know. Maybe it's a possibility. I'll definitely open up. You know, I'm definitely open to fight him. But you know, it, you just man in boxing, you never know what's gonna happen. You don't never know who you think you're gonna fight and who you're not gonna fight. You just you never think about it. I never thought. Man, listen, I never thought I'd fight Devin. I never thought I'd fight. I mean, I didn't. Um. What's that when, you know, me and Devin, we was cool a long time ago. We was all taking pictures. We was all together in Dallas before in New York and all that stuff and taking pictures and all that stuff. And then, like, fighting him is like, I never thought I'd fight him. So in boxing, bro, like, you – and that's why you really – they say you can't have friends in boxing because you really – you literally don't know who you're going to fight. Like, you could fight anybody at any time. You know, if they even just around your weight. You know, it might be somebody that's not even around your weight. So for me, anybody from 130 to, like, 147 – it's a possibility that I can fight them, basically, you know, because we can meet at that 140, um, right in the middle at that 140. So, yeah, I mean, we'll see. Whatever happens, happens, man. Like I said, my my goal is to become a champion again, and you know, then after I'll, I'll kind of figure out like what I want to do. But right now, be a champion again. Right, and you know, the the pound for pound picture keeps changing on a daily basis uh, as the fights go on. We had Inouye fighting last week. Uh, who is your current number one pound for pound fighter in the world? Uh, Usyk. Right now, Usyk. Usyk is number one pound for pound. For me, it was a long time with Terrence Crawford, um, but I can't put him as number one no more just because of his last performance. Um, and, and maybe I mean I can't really say Crawford getting older, not like that because you know he had he 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 did go up a division, and um, ah, Kel, my wife is calling me. Well, we'll wrap it oh. up soon. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it's cool. Um, but like I said, we, we, yeah, it was, it was, um, yeah, it was Terrence Crawford, but I can't, I can't say him right now, but just because his last fight and he went up and he's getting older and he took a long time, he took a long break. But uh, right now, I would say Usyk, Usyk is, I think Usyk has probably the best resume right now. If you look at Usyk's, you got to go by resume. You look at Usyk's resume, it, it's no comparison. <laughs> I think you uh, have experience in this facing the bigger fighter. Obviously, you and Devin weighed in the same, but you guys were at different weights on mm -hmm. fight night. And Usyk, right. of course, was about 50 pounds lighter than Tyson Fury. Mm -hmm. Guys like Crawford, when he wants to fight against uh, Canelo Alvarez, three divisions apart. And then you have guys like Canelo, who 
need to fight the bigger guy in Benavides. How important is actually size in the ring? And do you think a guy like Terrence Crawford, the last thing he should be doing is fighting at 168 pounds against someone like Canelo? No, I don't think I never thought. I mean, listen, I, I love Crawford, man. Me and Crawford are cool. And I think Crawford is a, is a is not just a great fighter right now. I think Crawford is an all-time great. You know, you look at his resume, what he's done, Crawford is an all-time great for sure. You gotta put him in that in that in that category. But I just don't think as far as after seeing him, what he did with the other dude, that 54 pounder, I just can't as far as 68 with a Canelo, I just don't see it. I just can't see it. You know, because Canelo's not just a big puncher. Canelo can box also and Canelo has a high IQ. So I just, you know, I don't I don't see him you know, doing nothing like that with, um, yeah, with Canelo.